Well, good afternoon, and thank you for your attention during the, the safety video. Uh, my name's Philip Kent, and I'm the university librarian here at the University of Melbourne. I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present uh, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians who have made a contribution to the life of the university community. Welcome everybody and uh, this is the Information Futures Forum on o Open Government and Freedom of Information. So if you're in the wrong spot, it's now the right time to leave. I would especially like to welcome our guests from the State Revenue Office, Ombudsman Victoria, Privacy Victoria, the State Department of Treasury and Finance, uh, and from other academic institutions, Swinburne University, RMIT University and Gordon TAFE. And of course, a pleasure to welcome students, staff, alumni, and friends of the University of Melbourne here today. Firstly, some other quick housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded and the, vi the video will be published on the library's website. And toilets are located in the foyer outside the theatre, uh, round to the right, and just follow the signs. And uh, you've heard the, the uh, video, so if there is any um, emergency, uh, we will look after you and help you out. Um, finally, after the forum, we'll be uh, serving afternoon tea in the foyer, and you're very welcome to stay and continue uh, what I think is going to be a very lively and interesting conversation. The Information Futures Forum is a series of occasional lectures where we explore current issues and new ideas about society's relationship with the information which we create, share and try to preserve. Normally our focus is on information that relates to the academic world, the evidence and products of research activity, the materials that are created for learning and teaching, and the varied and utterly unique museum and cultural collections that we have here that tell a story about society over decades and centuries. However, today we're going to focus on a slightly different but related topic. Our special guest speaker, Miriam Nisbet, is the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS. OGIS is the United States Government's Freedom of Information Ombudsman and is responsible for resolving FOI disputes between federal agencies and requesters, answering questions, tracking suggestions, and providing information to both the public and government. Congress has charged OGIS with reviewing FOI policies, procedures, and compliance by federal agents. Miriam is a keynote, or was a keynote speaker um, last week at the International Council on Archives 2012 Congress, which was held in Brisbane. And we're very grateful to the council for facilitating Miriam's visit with us to the University of Melbourne. Her topic today is open government, are we there yet? And how can we tell? Please make her welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I always like to be sure somebody is, is listening. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, this is, uh, I arrived in Melbourne on Saturday, and this is um, my, the second city ever in Australia that I've visited. I was in Brisbane, as Philip said, at the International Council on Archives. Um, ICA holds a Congress every four years, and uh, the one in Brisbane was the first time that uh, one has ever been held. It's, this is an organization that's about 60 years old, and it's the first time it's ever been in this hemisphere. And um, I think it was a fabulous choice, and uh, delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk 
a little bit. And then uh, what I'd really like is for us to have a bit of a, a conversation as advertised. Um, because um, first of all, it's after lunch. So um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're able to be engaged, it'll be a lot more interesting for you and it'll be more interesting for me as well. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, the United States Freedom of Information Act, um, why my office, which is very, very new, a recent development in the law, why we exist. Um, I'm also going to talk about, in addition to um, sort of what the law is, some of the practical issues that the United States has faced with implementing a law that we've had for um, about 45 years now. Uh, you'll notice that there are some similarities with the law in your country. Um, I also am certainly going to want to talk about records management, uh, a little bit about technology, a little bit about the problems that journalists face, so hopefully, um, amongst all of those topics, we'll be able to hit things that you're interested in and uh, we can have a, a bit of an exchange. As I mentioned, uh, the law in the United States dealing with access to information is um, pretty, pretty well established now. Uh, enacted 45 years ago, but it really, the law itself, even though um, relatively young uh, in our country, is really based upon very much the principles of uh, the founders of our, our government, um, who wrote and talked extensively about the importance of access to information um, by the citizens in order for there to be accountability, in order for democracy to work. So very, very fundamental idea that if you are living, or if you're living in a country, if you are being governed, if you do not have information about what your government is up to, uh, how it's operating, being able to look for yourself at what's going on, um, the government isn't going to work properly. You must be engaged. You must um, be able to get access. Nonetheless, it was uh, not until 1966 that our Congress passed a law, and it was really quite pathetic. It was a good start, but it was a very weak and anemic law. Um, and then we had President Richard Nixon. And his, um, his um, activities of um, uh, great concern to people in the country, to the Congress, um, to people around the world in terms of um, a president being up to, quote, dirty tricks in order to be reelected, um, led to quite a bit of uh, outrage and a lot of concern with, um, we really need to beef up the law. We need to put some teeth into our access law um, because we really can't have this kind of thing going on. We have to be able to, uh, people have to easily be able to see what is going on with the government. Um, so um, our Congress passed um, significant reforms um, in 1974. Um, we, we like to say we were the original open government law. Um, Everybody talks about open government today. We're going to talk about that. Certainly, that's something the Australian government is um, very, very involved in, in promoting. Um, but it all starts with freedom of information. So um, in 1974, really, the act was beefed up. And um, then there have been a number of changes since then. Um, in other words, um, I think our Congress has certainly had the, the feeling that um, the law is not something that was perfectly written to begin with, and in fact, it needed to be refined. As experience taught us um, more about how to implement the law, um, it needed to be changed. By the way, um, our law only reaches our executive branch departments and agencies. It does not um, require disclosure by our Congress, 
um, or by our courts. However, um, each of those branches of the government have very uh, well-established traditions of open hearings, open uh, court proceedings, uh, information being very much out there. Um, a lot of people think that Congress should definitely make the law applicable to it. Um, and every year, it seems, there is a member of Congress who introduces um, a Freedom of Information Act amendment to apply to Congress. And every year, it does not pass. So you can hold your breath on, on that. But the changes that have been made have really tr attempted to deal with some very practical issues, um, including uh, the time limits for responding, uh, which were originally 10 working days, very short amount of time, particularly for a large department like the Department of Defense, the Department of State, Department of Justice, uh, to be able to respond to a request. Um, <clears throat> fees. Um, technology, um, but the basic concept has remained the same, and that is anybody, anywhere can ask for records on any subject. Don't have to give a reason, you simply have to ask. Pretty simple. So the most recent big changes were in 2007. Um, one of the things that Congress did was to create uh, the Office of Government Information Services, and that's the office that, um, that I'm head of. Um, uh, it did not get set up until 2009, so we're just about to come up on our third year anniversary um, in another couple of weeks. September 2009 is when we opened our doors. I say we, um, I walked in the door, <laughs> um, and um, then had to find staff and, get it all set up. Um, our mission is really twofold, um, as Philip explained. Uh, one part of our mission is to look at how the process works, look at the Freedom of Information Act, look at how agencies um, are implementing the law, how they're complying with the law, and recommending uh, changes to Congress and the President to improve the process. Um, in that sense, and particularly taking complaints from the public about systemic problems is what leads, um, partly leads our Congress to um, refer to our office as the FOIA Ombudsman. Um, the words are not in the statute, but every time I go and testify, that's how I get introduced. So Congress had the idea that they wanted a, 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 a new procedure in the law, uh, a new um, ability for agencies and the public to be able to come to one place and um, you know have some have someone hear their complaints and make recommendations for improving the other piece of what we do is to actually um, provide mediation services resolve disputes in actual cases so um, individuals can come to us um, we also work at the request sometimes of agencies who are having difficulty with um, a requester or sometimes agencies who are dealing with a request that say gone to 40 different agencies and there's an interest in having a little bit of coordination there. In other words, we help in any way that we can. So that's the dispute resolution uh, piece and a bit of the customer service piece as well. Looking at access to information and the right to ask for information um, in a less adversarial way, really treating the public in the way it should be treated, which is you paid for it, it's your information, it's your government, let us help you get access to that as opposed to putting up barriers and putting up obstacles. So we'll talk a little bit when we get to the conversation part. You can ask me, how is that working? We also, in our law, had some changes to really, for the first time, expressly give executive responsibility, high-level responsibility in every department and agency to make the FOIA process work better. I think that's really critical. Um, it's saying this is something that has to be part of how the government works, and somebody 
at the top has to, has to care about it. Now, fortunately for my office, we came, um, because we opened our doors in September 2009, we were really coming in on the heels of directives from President Obama that had been issued in January 2009, the first day that he was in office. Um, directives to the heads of agencies and departments saying there were two, actual, two, two different memos. Uh, one that said, we've got to do a better job of open government. We've got to do a better job of making our work transparent, being accountable to people, opening up for collaboration between the government and um, the public. Uh, and then a separate memorandum saying the Freedom of Information Act is really essential to the way we operate and that needs to be improved too. So in other words, Congress passed, a, made amendments to the law, setting up a new office, adding customer service and executive responsibility, followed by a change in administration and President Obama coming in and saying, make it happen. Very important. That's um, certainly leadership at the top. Um, we have a challenge, and I know you all have a challenge. Um, uh, for some of, some of you whom I've had a chance to talk with today, um, we're, we're certainly talking um, great opportunities with technology, um, but also how do we actually begin to harness the technology to work for us um, in some very forward-looking ways. Um, if, if there, is there anybody here that's particularly interested in information technology? I'm hoping that's going to be a lot of you, if I could just sort of see, okay. Um, we can talk a little bit. I'll tell you about a project um, that my office has been involved in to create a multi-agency FOIA portal, a one-stop shop for people to be able to make requests regardless of what agency they're looking for and also one place that people can look for records that have been disclosed under FOIA. Um, it sounds pretty simple and it sounds like something that um, why, why hasn't it been done before, but it, um, it's been quite a challenge. <clears throat> so for those of you in, uh, in the room whose business it is every day to worry about records management, um, I salute you. Um, we, we are all, whether it's Australia, whether it's the United States, countries that are fortunate enough to have, particularly have electronic records, electronic record keeping systems. Um, we have a lot that we're trying to do. We're trying to manage our agency business every day carry out our mission, whether it's law enforcement or uh, energy, the environment, health, transportation. Um, we also have to respond to our legislative overseers. Um, we have to defend ourselves or bring cases in litigation. And we have Freedom of Information Act. And in all of those roles, we are looking at how we can work better um, to use technology, how we can manage records, and for the archivist in the room, um, preserve forever, uh, since that's what archives are all about. Um, certainly, I know that you face the same problem we do. We have too much. We're drowning in information, and it's growing exponentially when we're talking about electronic records. Um, one problem that we have faced in our office um, has been working with agencies who are trying to respond to requests for complex databases. Um, it scares a, a lot of people in the freedom of information business um, because they are not technologists. Um, they're, they're dealing with more traditional access and they don't necessarily know um, how to even respond to a request that involves um, millions of fields of data. 
um, working through that process, figuring out how to release the data that can be released, still protect privacy, um, has been a, a very, a very interesting challenge. But it goes across, across. Um, my boss, the Archivist of the United States, um, really says over and over again, trying to get the ear of everybody in government who cares about these things, records management is the backbone of open government. And if you cannot keep the records, if you can't manage the records, if you can't find the records for whatever purpose, whether it's freedom of information, whether it's for litigation, whether it's for your daily business, well, we don't have any access. So um, we're, we're looking at, in the United States, um, a directive. Again, um, President Obama issued a directive last November to heads of departments and agencies saying, you got to get serious about records management. We have got to bring the government along. We have to figure out how to manage records, and particularly electronic records. And so that is a really strong, um, strong initiative that we have right now. And it's absolutely, if you're talking about accountability, if you're talking about transparency, if you're talking about open government, you have to have a piece of that. Um, I know that Australia is not yet, I hope it will be, a member of the Open Government Partnership, which is the global effort to bring open government to many um, countries. Um, but our national action plan, the US national action plan for open government, has a lot of pieces to it. Um, two of the pieces include improving Freedom of Information Act and also improving records management. So that, that's a strong initiative. I also feel like we probably share Australia and the United States share uh, the great good fortune of having more, re more resources. And don't laugh at me, because if you're, if you're here and you're worried about records management and archives, you're going to say, of course, we don't have enough resources. But um, for those of you who were at the N International Council on Archives Congress, and you talk to uh, people from countries, for example, in Africa or in um, other parts of the Pacific, besides here, um, you know that we are incredibly fortunate in our countries in what has been devoted to and the professional standing of records managers and archivists. Um, the programs are incredibly strong compared to a lot of places. We're, we're very fortunate. Um, as I said, our records management is um, a key part of how we see open government. Um, we also have a huge initiative to promote um, proactive disclosure. Uh, I know that you all are doing the same here. Um, we have, uh, in the United States, a number of initiatives. Um, some of them are listed here. Um, and agencies are working really hard to get huge amounts of data out there. Um, for those of us in the freedom of information world, those of us in the archives world, we have to keep reminding our colleagues at agencies that are all about data that the proactive disclosure piece has to include all kinds of information holdings. Data is great. Data are great. Databases are wonderful. Millions of data sets, terrific. Um, but it's about more than data. <clears throat> People ask, um, well, if so much information is being disclosed proactively, agencies are being pushed to get it out there, do we need a Freedom of Information Act? Well, of course we do. If anyone would disagree with that, I would love to include that in the conversation. Um, I just actually can't imagine that any of us would feel very comfortable with saying, oh, well, we'll just be happy with whatever the government agencies decide to give us. I don't think that works very well. It's wonderful to have it out there. 
it's wonderful to encourage that. But you still need people to be able to ask for what they want. Still to be able to ask for those kinds of records that the government is really not eager to get a request for. And to have a way that you can push it forward. You've got to be able to have an appeal process. You've got to be able to have an ombuds, information commissioner, an office, somebody that you can go to when you feel like it's, the system is not working. And of course, um, we believe strongly in uh, having an enforcement process through our courts, uh, which actually in our case has, um, not that anybody welcomes litigation, uh, but uh, we now have thousands of decisions by our courts, including from our Supreme Court, that really, um, really are extremely helpful in interpreting the law and also making clear that agencies have a responsibility and that they must disclose certain information while still protecting privacy. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother um, discussion that we can have. Um, so I'm going to sort of wrap up a little bit here. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the importance of leadership. And um, I've touched a little bit about culture, culture change. Um, that really is probably the hardest thing that we have to do is for those of us who are in the access to information world, um, trying to ensure that um, people who are working for government agencies, regardless of what field they're in, regardless of what program they're in charge of, understand that <clears throat> the records that they're creating, that they're holding, that they're working with are not their, their information, not their records. They belong to the public. Unless there's a good reason, they have to be disclosed. If you can articulate a good reason, and there are very good reasons that information cannot necessarily be disclosed at least right away, um, that's fine. That is part of the balance of the law, to recognize the right to ask for information, but also to recognize the reasons including privacy, personal privacy, individual personal privacy, national security law enforcement, um, other reasons that information can't be disclosed. But that the fundamental commitment has to be, this is a good thing. This is makes our government work better. It makes us more transparent. It makes us accountable. And making that part of the culture of, of course, we can do this. Of course, we have to do this. We want to do this. And um, let's deal with it in a not in an adversarial way is really critical. So the last thing that I just want to mention, and this is the part of the title of the talk, um, how do we know? Are we there yet? Um, and how do we know? Um, this is something that I would love to, to talk with you all about. We have a hard time in our office, the new ombuds office, figuring out whether or not we are effective. Now, we, we feel that way. I, I say we. Um, we have a staff of seven, uh, including myself, um, which we have a big customer base. It's all the departments and agencies and, uh, and the public really are who we consider our customer base. Um, how do we know that we're making a difference? Um, Congress expressly, explicitly intended that we would be able to help avoid lawsuits. Um, a very timely, um, time-consuming and costly uh, exercise for the government and for requesters. Um, sometimes it's necessary, but it's probably not the most desirable or expeditious way to go about access. Um, but how do we determine if there are fewer lawsuits, whether or not we're making a difference through providing dispute resolution. How do you measure that? How do you make the connection? Um, 
we are looking at ways, and we have some sort of customer service uh, surveys that we have developed, that is my office has developed, for um, people who actually come to us, bring a case. We've had now over a thousand cases that we've handled um, in, in these almost three years. Um, we can talk to our customers, the people who come to us, but how, how do we know that we're, that we're even reaching a, a tiny fraction? The United States government receives somewhere around 600,000 requests a year, which is an awful lot of requests. We handle, and so far in the three years, we've averaged about um, 350 cases a year. So a tiny fraction of complaints that are coming to us. Um, we also don't have necessarily a good way of connecting the success of those in the agencies who are now using dispute resolution. Um, if they are successful in what they do at the agency level, we never hear about it. So how do you measure the disputes that you've prevented, even if you can count the disputes that you've resolved? So if any of you have any bright ideas for how we can figure out whether or not we're, now I'm just talking about my office. Overall, of course, open government. We know it's good. We know that proactive disclosure is great. We know that the um, opening up of lines of communication, including among the agencies, the government agencies, is good. I don't know about you all in the United States. We have huge departments and agencies. And even within them, people are operating in their own silos. They're not talking to each other. We know a team approach works best for dealing with access requests. You need the people who work with the Freedom of Information Act. You need the people who are the records managers. You need the information technology people. You need the, um, your legal affairs people. And you also need the people in the program offices. I mean, you have to have all of those people working together and communicating. And it is amazingly hard to do. And then you start talking about getting agencies to talk to each other and collaborate. How do we know whether we're doing a good job? How do we know whether or not we're making those connections? How do we know whether or not we're really opening up those communications? And how do we know when we are really successfully collaborating with members of the public? It helps in a society in which we do have freedom of speech, freedom of expression, because people will tell you very quickly if you are not doing a good job. And that's great. Um, but you don't know if you're hearing from the right people. Uh, measurement. It's a huge issue, and we're, we're just beginning to make some baby steps with that. I know that some of the academics are looking at this and trying to figure this out sort of long term, but you know, we want to know right now whether or not we're succeeding. So I'll end with my public service announcement. I know you all are here. You're probably not concerned about what's going on in Washington too much, except maybe there's something called a presidential election that you might be following a little bit. Um, but um, we're, uh, we're there. Um, I can't, my, my staff would not be happy if I said that we're available 24-7. <laughs> but the email works. It comes in. We read it. We're there. And um, we also, um, we, we would love to hear from you. So I hope we'll hear from you right now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Miriam. We'll, we'll thank Miriam formally uh, at the end of the session, but as Miriam indicated, we wanted to make this a little bit more interactive. And so to lead into that interactive um, 
session, um, I'd like to invite Dr Dennis Muller to offer some remarks and also to respond to some of the issues in Miriam's presentation. Dennis is a lead leading expert on media ethics and worked as a journalist for 27 years. He was assistant editor at the Sydney Morning Herald and associate editor at The Age. While at The Age, he spent several years overseeing the FOI applications made by journalists and very often pursuing those applications through the relevant courts. Since 1995, Dennis has conducted independent social and policy research across education, health, environment and media fields. He teaches media ethics and is an author of Media Ethics and Disasters. Most recently, he has been examining media coverage of the Black Saturday bushfires. Dennis is a fellow at the Centre for Advanced Journalism here at the University, and we're delighted to have him here with us today. Please welcome Dennis. When I was thinking about the title for that book, Media Ethics and Disasters, I thought some smart person will put an insertion in and say, Media Ethics and Other Disasters. <laughs> but it was all about Black Saturday. Miriam, I was fascinated to, to hear that, uh, that account. Um, there are so many parallels with uh, our experience here. Uh, so many parallels between the ideals um, that are underpinning FOI in America and here, uh, parallels even historically. Um, for example, uh, it was the Watergate scandal um, that gave great impetus to two things here in Australia that are relevant. One uh, is to the enactment of FOI legislation here. It was, in fact, a factor. It was part of the momentum, uh, but it also gave momentum to the whole concept of investigative journalism. Uh, up till that time, uh, in Australia anyway, uh, we had nothing of the kind of uh, investigative capabilities that were exhibited by Woodward and Bernstein in disclosing the Watergate cover-up. Um, and it was at the age, long before my time, uh, that they established the first investigative journalism team in Australia. It was called the Insight Team. And it was my great privilege when I came to the age to edit that Insight Team for a while. So you can see how Watergate uh, had direct influences here, both in terms of public policy and media practice. Our FOI law is 30 years old. Um, the Victorian Act was enacted in uh, 1982, came into effect in July 1983, and the Commonwealth likewise was first off the mark in Australia with, with its act in 1982. Subsequently, other states followed. Uh, and many of the difficulties and issues that you drew attention to, uh, in particular, the way the exemptions uh, administered, the issue of fees, how fees were used to, to jack up the threshold to make access more expensive and more difficult, uh, the time limits, especially for journalists who operate on a, even back in the day, operated on a 24-hour basis, uh, time limits of 45 days for a response to a request made FOI a kind of act of last resort. But Paul Chadwick, uh, who in fact is now the Director of Editorial Policies at the ABC, uh, but at this time was a journalist on the age, uh, was determined to make FOI really work. He wrote this book, um, which is how to use the freedom of information laws. It's basically written for journalists, and it's a terrific sort of step-by-step um, -step guide on how to use the, the Act. But unfortunately, because of the difficulties uh, in using the Act, it was always very hard to get journalists to actually use it. My job, well, one of my many jobs at the age, was to sit down in the morning, look at the paper, and uh, look for FOI opportunities. 
and then to go to the roundsman, you know, if it was a story about education, I'd go to the education reporter and say, hey, listen, why don't we put an FOI request in for this? And the, the reporters used to see me coming and say, oh, no, oh, geez, no. <laughs> too difficult, you know, better things to do with my time. But we did, in fact, um, run a lot of cases. Um, Bill Birnbauer, who's now, I'm afraid, left the age and is teaching at uh, Monash, uh, Bill was a great user of FOI and I used to sit with all of his reporters and help them formulate the request and then we used to pursue it and I had a budget of about, about a million bucks in those wonderful days to, um, to pursue these cases in the courts where our legal advice was that in fact we ought to be challenging uh, decisions not to disclose. Uh, and the, the main exemption over which we ran, or the main two exemptions over which we ran these cases, was the cabinet documents exemption and the so-called internal working documents exemption. And I'm afraid to say we lost most of our court cases and we spent a lot of money in vain, but at least we did help to delineate some of the boundaries of, of FOI. But more often, in fact, what we got were not stories about the substantive issue on which we'd sought the documents in the first place, most of our stories had to do with the process of trying to get the documents. And we would write many, many stories um, trying to hold up the bureaucracy to ridicule, to be frank, uh, to show uh, how difficult it was to get stuff out. The, the bureaucracy had all sorts of tricks for not disclosing. They used to, for example, they used to write the decisions or the critical considerations on yellow post-it stickers and then they'd peel them off and they'd give you the document without the yellow stickers. That was one. Um, they, th there's a story in here about how the special branch, the, which is the, it's the branch of our police service that's a bit like the FBI, the, the sort of political thought police, um, they were disbanded uh, in uh, August of 83, just after the FOI Act came in, in Victoria, uh, and they pulped about 2,000 records, despite an express instruction from the Minister not to do so. Um, my, I myself had a, um, a particular case where we asked the Department, of what was it called in those days? It probably had the word innovation in it somewhere. Um, anyway, it was the sort of business department um, for documents which showed the reasons behind the government's decision to give an enormous uh, subsidy to Alcoa, the aluminium company, uh, to build its Portland aluminium smelter and to give it discount electric power um, for, I think it's still running actually, I think it's for about 30 years or something. So it was a monumental... Um, financial decision and infrastructure decision. So we went to the department or whatever it was and we asked for these documents and they came back to us and solemnly said, uh, we have found two documents on this matter. And we thought this was improbable. And this is where the ombudsman came in. And the ombudsman's office in Victoria is terrific, I gotta say. And they took up the cudgels and they went into the department and found 2,000 documents. Um, and unfortunately for the department, the, um, the responsible minister was a bloke called Fordham, and he at the time was the deputy premier. And this was, this was brought up in parliament, uh, and to the minister's great embarrassment. And so the secretary to the department was sent down to the age to apologise. And there was this hilarious meeting where um, this guy called Hans Eisen arrived with a long retinue of advisers and uh, support people and they all filed into the editor's office. Now, the editor of the age in those days was a very combative rooster called Creighton Burns. Creighton had been, a, a, a fact, a political scientist at the university. And, but Burns was a feisty little rooster. And, and we're sitting down, and, and Hans Eisen is trying to be the diplomat, you know, and he's saying, Mr Burns, um, we've come down to apologise, and we've come down to see how we could um, better facilitate relationships and information flow between our department and your newspaper. And Burns started to pull on his tie, which is always a bad sign. <laughs> and he leaned forward and he thumped 
the side of his chair and he said, Mr. Ison, he said, getting any bloody information out of your department seems to be a beyond human endeavour. And so that sort of set the tone for the, for the meeting. Um, and uh, so we continued to write these stories to try to provoke, um, or try to not to, to provoke, I suppose, more to demonstrate uh, how the act, when the act was not working, despite the very best intentions of the, the Premier of the day, John Kane, who had been the motive force behind it. Uh, John was a great reforming Premier of Victoria, and this was one of his most far-reaching reforms. Um, but it was a demonstration of how difficult it is to get cultural change. You mentioned cultural change towards the end, and it is so difficult, isn't it? Um, and so what we tried to do was to, to show um, just how difficult it was to get past this culture of secrecy, which is a deeply embedded part of, of bureaucracy. Obviously, people who hold information want to hang on to it, um, not necessarily out of shame or anything else, but because information is power, and it can be embarrassing and difficult to, uh, to release, especially to, to, the, to the media, whom you can't, you can't trust as far as you can kick them. So there are all sorts of cultural problems. And so we would write these stories, and I finally wrote a piece which sent John Cain mad. And it was, it was a great big feature about these, this procession of attempts to stymie the operations of the Act. And, and John rang Creighton, and he said to him, Creighton, he said, that Muller is a threat to the Westminster system of government. And Burns couldn't get into my office quick enough to tell me. And he was, and I said, yes. <laughs> you can get a sense of the, <laughs> of, the, of the healthy tensions, I think, between the fourth estate and the other three, or certainly the executive government. Um, so that was the, uh, that has always been, I think, uh, indicative of the way in which FOI uh, has played out. Um, and it's, the whole thing centres on these exemptions. Now, I, th I agree that a lot of the exemptions are there for very good reason. I mean, they're there to protect national security, to protect people's privacy, mm -hmm. to protect people's trade secrets, um, to protect... Um, the proper processes of, of cabinet government. You can't have cabinet government uh, with the uh, actual debates of cabinet being bandied about in public. Of course you can't. Um, but, but the difficulty is that, um, that the way in which the act or the acts in Australia have been constructed makes it difficult for public servants, I think, to make uh, decisions that tend towards disclosure rather than tend towards non-disclosure. And, for example, in the Commonwealth Act, there's a whole bunch of absolute exemptions, if you like, which include those Cabinet document ones. And then there are the so-called um, uh, conditional exemptions, which include things like trade secrets and personal privacy and so on. And the Act... When it's, in, when it's trying to give guidance to the public servants about making these decisions, says um, you must decide this on the basis of whether disclosure <coughs> would or could reasonably expect, be expected to unreasonably affect someone adversely. That's the sort of mishmash of legislation that you're asking public servants to, to deal with. And very often... The, the people making these decisions are not senior people. They're comparatively junior, though their decisions can be reviewed higher up. So there's a necessity for our, act to be, uh, our acts to be revisited, for, their, for changes to be made that makes disclosure the default position rather than non-disclosure. So I think that's about, I think, what I, what I really wanted to say, um, except to finish on one point that technology, which Miriam referred to, is terrific. Modern technology is wonderful. But nothing will change until culture changes. Have the best technology in the world, but without the will, it won't do any good. Thanks. <laughs>